Welcome to Motor Track Test, where we take the latest and greatest performance cars to the limit at the challenging Bryant Park hill climb circuit. We'll do a deep dive on the car's dynamics, try the different drive modes, and then wrap it up with a track score. Today's track test stars the Toyota GR Supra. I'll quickly run you through the specs, we'll hit the track to see how it performs, and then set a lap time. Before that, don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and let us know which cars you want to see as track test in the comments below. This being the updated Supra means that the 3 litre turbocharged straight 6 produces 285 kilowatts and 500 newton metres. We've also got an 8 speed automatic gearbox and an electronically controlled limited slip diff. Weight is 1500 kilos, give or take, and this being the GDS means we've got 348 millimeter brake rotors and four piston calipers front and rear. Wheels are 19s and the Michelin Pilot Supersport tires measure 255 millimeters at the front and 275 millimeters rear. Enough talk, let's drive. Today I am driving the Toyota Supra, but before I get into the nitty gritty of what this thing's like on track, I want to talk a bit about the car itself, because a lot of people on the internet have a real problem with the Supra, because it's basically a BMW underneath. If you're not aware somehow, this thing is basically the chassis and engine from a Z4 M40i with a Toyota badge on it. And that's a bit of an oversimplification because Toyota did do their own development and stuff to make it feel a bit different, but the raw materials are the same. But I don't have a problem with that. I'm gonna tell you why you shouldn't have a problem with it either. A lot of people go, oh, you know, it's not a real Toyota. Toyota didn't do anything and that's true. And in a perfect world, it would be great if Toyota made its own clean sheet sports car like it did with the GA Yaris. However, not enough people buy sports cars for Toyota to invest that amount of money in making their own sports car. So therefore, the choice is Toyota joins up with BMW to make a joint venture sports car, or we have no Supra at all. And if that's the choice, have no Supra or this Supra, I will choose this Supra every time because this car is awesome. So there's my little rant. Let's go through the car bit by bit and I'll talk about what it does, what it feels like on track, how it handles, how it performs, and then of course, we'll go for a lap time. So, let's talk about this engine, because this engine is fantastic. That's one of the big things about the Supra. Everyone loved the 2JZ, the 1JZ, or 2JZ, if you're from the States, and it was a cracking engine, no doubt. Absolutely awesome. So again, why would Toyota go to the trouble of making a new engine factory, a new engine from scratch, when the end result would probably be pretty similar to the B58 that's in this car. BMW makes some of the best straight six engines going around, so Toyota could have spent, you know, $100 million or whatever to make their own engine and end up with something that was probably, let's say, best case scenario, as good as the thing in this. This being the updated Supra, we've got 285 kilowatts and 500 newton meters. That's 35 kilowatts more than the original Supra and it really wakes this car up. The original Supra, I'm not gonna say it had more chassis than engine, but it did lack a little bit at the top end. So it had this massive head of torque, whereas now, it's got more power over a bigger rev range, so you've got more power more of the time, which is always good, but it also really stretches out to, what have we got here, 6,500 RPM. And, as you can see, <laughs> we'll get to the handling in a minute, but as you can see, it's got the grunt to light up these tyres at will. It's actually changed how you drive the car. There you go, it lights up in third over that crest. The last car probably wouldn't do that. You could drive it with more confidence in the throttle, whereas this, now it's got this extra grunt, it's more traction limited, which is a lot of fun. The other thing that takes a bit of adjustment is this eight-speed automatic. Now, I know it sounds weird, because we've had eight-speed gearboxes for a while now, but 
if you grew up driving five speed manuals like me or maybe six speed manuals, you approach a corner, a tight corner, and there are plenty of those here at Bryant Park, and you think, I need second gear for this corner. I don't know, it's just an automatic thing. You go, I need second gear. But the gearing in this car is so short that second gear only goes to about 85 k's an hour. What have we got there? 80, yeah, 85 k's an hour. So, you really have to slow the car down to grab second. It's only really possible for the very, very tightest of corners, hairpins almost. So more often than not, you're using third, which is a slight adjustment, but not a problem either because this engine easily has the torque low down to pull third out of, again, all but the tightest of corners. It does mean though that if you do get wheel spin or oversteer, it can often be a little bit quicker than you think because you get <laughs> the wheel speed gets up above 100 k's an hour quite quickly like that Whoa. but as i said in terms of engine gearbox powertrain there's not really a lot wrong with this car sounds good heaps of grunt heaps of power revs well gearbox is nice and slick again can be a bit reluctant to go down to second because of its really really low ratio but Apart from that, gear shifts are slick, it's good. The other thing I love about this car is the diff. Now you don't often really talk about a differential, but a couple of the cars we've had here recently, if they've picked up an inside wheel with the curbs here or the cambers, they'll just spin the inside wheel. The diff won't lock tightly enough, and that both hurts you in terms of putting a traction down, because you're not getting full traction, it hurts you in terms of predictability because you think the car's gonna act one way and then it acts a totally different way. It's just not that much fun, really. What you really want is for the back two tires to grip and slip at the same time, which helps you, yeah, again, helps you under traction, but it also makes the car more predictable. And that's something that Super does really, really well. The diff in this car must be super tight because at no point do I get any inside wheel spin. Either two are spinning, or we've got total traction. All right, now we're starting to have some fun. You can actually adjust the sport mode through this individual setting, which means you can adjust the engine, gearbox, suspension, and steering through comfort or sport individually. However, I'm just gonna keep it in normal mode because not only does it keep the steering lighter, it gives the throttle a bit more progression, doesn't make it as sharp, and the extra body roll through the softer suspension actually gives me a bit more feedback, it makes the car, I think, a little bit more fun. So we'll leave it in that for the time being, but I'll probably stick it in sport mode for the lap time. So, again, the other thing about the steering is, this steering wheel is a little bit strange. It's, I'd prefer if it was a bit more rounded because the edges are almost squared off, which makes it a little bit uncomfortable to hold. But, small thing. Let's get to the chassis now. The chassis on this thing is so much fun. It's so adjustable you can basically get it to do anything you want. The one caveat to that is, this car has a relatively short wheelbase, so its reactions are quite sudden. If you're driving it fast, like on a, for a lap time, you gotta be, a, you know, you gotta be on the ball to make sure that, um, stop for a skid. <laughs> As I was saying, the chassis on this car is an absolute peach. It is so much fun, this car, I love it. Why is it a peach? Because, as I said, the reactions can be quite sudden because it's quite a short wheelbase car. It's quite square in its stance. However, once you get beyond that, you can trust it. And the good thing is, that once it's settled into a corner, it's really easy to drive. Super easy to drive. It's a bit of an M car trait actually, which sort of makes sense being a BMW. You've got quite a lot of grip, so you've got to break the grip and doing so is quite sudden. It doesn't like that zone of where you're you know, fighting the car. But if you break it and get it sideways, it's super adjustable, super easy to drive. It just sits there, that diff again, nice and stable, nice and predictable. And it puts a massive smile on your face. But it's not just about power oversteer. You can adjust this car on the brake. 
There you go. Bit of break. There you go. That was a big slide with no throttle. That's a sign of a good chassis because I can essentially drive it however I want. If I'm sensible, you know, gentle with the steering, gentle with the throttle, gentle with the brakes, driving properly, it's going to obey. It's going to obey what I want it to do. It's going to keep it neat and tidy, plenty of grip, plenty of traction. There we go. A bit of understeer. Treat it in with the throttle. Here we go again. A bit of gentle understeer. Rotate it on the brakes. Easy to control. Just feed it in, feed it in, keep it neat, neutral. A little bit of oversteer on the exit. But if I want to be silly, I can be. Just load in under the brakes, the rear goes, and use the throttle. Grab third mid slide. Hold a big slide. Oh, there we go. Back the other way. And the other way. <laughs> You just do whatever you want with it. It's just so playful. I mean, it's similar to the 86 in that regard. I mean, they've come from sort of different companies a bit, but the chief engineer was the same in both cases, Tatsuya Tata, and you can kind of tell. It's a car that allows you to drive it how you want to. The flip side of that is, it doesn't necessarily suffer fools because it's gonna to respond to your input. So then if you, you know, come off the brake hold too much brake oh there we go we've got some oversteer stuffed up there turn in too much oh look there we go oversteer again sloppy reactions doesn't like that so you've got to drive it well again that's a sign of a great sports car it rewards you if you drive it well it obeys your inputs and also as i said puts a massive smile on your face <laughs> and that's why i don't really get people's problem with this car it is so much fun and it's like a hundred grand you've been you know look at it as a cheap BMW I don't know look at it however you want this absolutely I think lives up to the Supra's lineage lives up to what a Supra should be and more importantly it's just a bucket of fun to drive there we go on the brakes Let's hold it much fun. Oh, I could drive this all day. But I've got to go set a lap time instead. So it's fun, but is it fast? Let's stick the drift box on and see what we can do. The Supra's impressive 105.3 is the quickest time we've recorded so far. It's torque and agility paying dividends around this tight track. Say what you want about the Supra's DNA, but there's no arguing with its performance. It's fast, fun, and basically everything you'd ever want a rear drive sports car to be, which is why it gets a track score of 9 out of 10.